regulatory cells. Uh, being in James lab, obviously, what we do to these animals, we treat them with a vaccine plus minus anti-CTLA-4 antibodies. And it's only when you add the anti-CTLA-4 antibody that you see this complete change in the landscape with a huge influx of CD8 positive T cells. And what looked, at least on the IF and later on on the quantification by flow, like a reduction in the propor proportion of T-Rex. So the balance switches, right? And we showed this a long, long time ago, and this has been shown in humans. So it's kind of a good biomarker for responses to IO when the balance of effectors to regulators switches and start favoring the effector compartment. What we thought at the time is that what we're doing here is just releasing the checkpoint CTLA-4 on CD8, and that's why you get so many CD8s over time, and that's what tells the balance. Um, and that, that tilting of the balance going for very low ratio of effectors to regulators to high ratio correlates directly with um, about 70% complete responses that we see in this model versus no mice being cured uh, if you leave them untreated. So if I fast forward uh, several years into work into my lab, um, actually we're not 100% wrong nor right on this. I, I think that there was a change in the balance, but we were really trying to understand the molecular basis for that change. And what we realized using now transgenic models in which we could track tumor reactive effector and tumor reactive regulatory T cells is that that change in the balance was actually due to a rapid disappearing uh, disappearance of the FOX3 positive regulatory T cells. So this is an experiment where you challenge a mouse with a tumor, you leave them untreated or treated with the GVAX, and then six hours later, uh, sorry, after the tumor is established, you look in the tumor and you find plenty of regulatory T cells, all of them tumor reactive. If you give them the anti-CTLA-4 antibody and you look at that tumor, six hours after you give the antibody, the T-Rex are all gone, right? So, so this started arguing against the fact that the antibody was just only blocking the checkpoint and allowing accumulation of effector cells because you cannot accumulate them that quickly. So we decided to question a little bit the dogma and we wonder whether the antibody was for some reason specifically killing the T-Rex, right? And, and that killing will have to be via a phenomenon known as antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity or ADCC. The good thing is that that's testable. And the way you usually test whether an antibody kills via ADCC, use mice that are knockout on FC receptors. So that's experiment that we did. This was still when I was here, but we we're doing experiments in Jim's lab and in my lab at UCL. And what you see here is that if you do the same experiment with anti-CTLA-4 in mice that cannot mediate ADCC, now the T-Rex are not eliminated. Right? So in a simple experiment, we're able to, to, to define that the FC receptors are critical for the activity of the antibody, meaning the depletion of the regulatory cells. And long story short, we show that this is independent of NK cells complement, and it requires the expression of specific FC receptors in mice, FC gamma receptor four, which is classically expressed by tumor infiltrating myeloid cells. Why is the antibody depleting primarily T-Rex and not effector cells in the tumor when the antibody was designed to block the checkpoint on the T-effector cells? Well, this is because in, in vivo, the cell that expresses the highest level of CTLA-4 on its surface in blue is the tumor infiltrating regulatory T cell. Meanwhile, the effector or the helper T cells in solid red, they express much lower levels. So the antibody is not, it's not a, 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 a entity that knows what to deplete. It will just target cells that express a lot of the target. And that happens to be the T-reg inside a tumor. And that killing of the T-reg is essential for the anti-tumor activity of the antibody. And that's shown in this experiment where you see that if the mice are treated, these are wild type animals and the, the antibody depletes the T-Rex, you get these 70% complete responses. But if you do the experiment in mice that are FC gamma receptor for knockout, where the antibody cannot deplete the T-Rex anymore, you cannot alter that balance. And then you get the dotted blue line, which means no tumor protection. So the depletion of the antibody is really critical to the final uh, tumor protection that we observe. And, and the model was based on, on receptor density, and by receptor, I mean CTLA-4 density within the tumor microenvironment. So the regulatory cells express a lot of CTLA-4, the effectors express very little or lower levels. Antibodies act just as antibodies that will opsonize and, and cluster around cells that express a lot of the target. And that allows clustering of FC receptors on macrophages. It could also happen on NK cells, and that leads to the depletion of the regulatory cells. The effector cells don't have enough to induce depletion, but the antibody, as Roberta says, also has a checkpoint blocking activity. So that's kind of the double whammy that we propose that the anti-CTLA-4 antibodies have. Kills the T-Rex, but also unleashes or release the brakes on the effector cells. Although that second activity, I think it needs uh, to be looked in more detail. 
So this generated a lot of excitement and, and we're not the only ones showing this. There was a team at BMS led by Alan Corman that showed pretty much the, exactly the same at the same time that we did using the mouse IgG2B antibodies um, that Roberta used on her experiments. So we got really excited about this and we wondered about developing anti-CTLA-4 antibodies with enhanced ADCC to promote better depletion of T-Rex and more anti-tumor activity. And we published a couple of papers on that. But it was looking at clinical samples that we got a little bit worried about them because of the following. This is human data now. And this is the expression of uh, CTLA-4 um, on the y-axis and ICOS on the x-axis uh, on regulatory cells, helper cells, and CD8 cells in PBMC of patients with cancer that will be in the blue or in the tumor infiltrated lymphocyte fraction in red. And what you see here, it's what's expected uh, that the T-Rex express very high levels of ICOS and CTLA-4. There is a fraction of the CD helper compartment that also expresses those and, and, and the CD8 cytotoxics infiltrate in the tumor, they express much lower levels. So the anti ctla 4 antibody that is in the clinic as it is, despite it being a human IgG1, which is a classical depleting isotype, we think that that antibody, if depleting, it's maybe taking the cells that are expressed the highest levels of CTLA-4 and sp sparing the CD8. You don't wanna kill the CD8. But the concern that we have is that if it were to be developed for the clinical setting, an antibody with enhanced ADCC, what that does, it pushes the threshold for killing down. So we might end up killing activated effector cells. So that made us nervous. And again, this is an hypothesis. We, we don't have data to demonstrate that part, but this was kind of the point at which we said, you know what, we need a more specific target. Um, and may I say, let's controversial target for T-reg depletion, because there is still argument on whether this antibody depletes in the clinic or not. And if we wanted a, a less controversial target, we did not do a good job. We went back to CD25, which is one of the oldest targets in the, in the um, arsenal of t killing agents. So it's a very old target. It was dropped for, by the pipeline. So what I hope I'm gonna offer you today is some new biological and mechanistic insight onto CD25. So the audience, I don't think it needs much, much of a um, background on this. CD25 is the high affinity receptor, subunit receptor for IL-2. Right? So in addition to CD25, you have the beta and the gamma receptors. And when the three get together, you signal via PSTAT5, PI3 kinase, and RAS. And that gets to, in general, the effector activation, Treg activation, and NK activation. It's very important cytokine signaling pathway. The fact that this receptor was described to be very high, highly activated on regulatory T cell made the feel that this was Shimo Sakaguchi's data in the 80s made them feel very excited about using antibodies to kill these cells by targeting CD25. But the conundrum was that we all know that if you take um, effector cells and you activate them in vitro, they will upregulate CD25, it's an activation marker. So then that makes it a really bad target for T-reg depletion because you do not want to kill effector cells. Now may I stress to you that this is, this data of activation, uh, upregulation and activated effector cells is primarily in vitro. So let's put some data to the table. So this is the expression profile of CD25 in different mouse models of cancer, looking at the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. This is a poorly infiltrated tumor, B16, and these two are highly infiltrated tumors, particularly MC8205, which is a chemically induced sarcoma transplantable cell line. Most of the CD8 in that tumor are k 67 positive. They express high levels of PD1. They all look very activated and very regulated. They don't express much CD25. The regulatory T cells express a lot of CD25, and there is a fraction of the helper compartment that does express CD25. So in my book, this looks like a very good distinguisher between effectors and regulator in mouse models in the tumor microenvironment. But we could complain and say that that's mouse. So what happens in human cells? It could be completely different. And the answer is that no, it's not completely different. This is data from patients with melanoma, non small cell lung cancer, and renal cell carcinoma. And here on the right, we're looking at the expression or the frequency of cells that are CD25 positive in, inside those tumors. And you see that the vast majority of CD25 positive cells are FOX3 positive. Meanwhile, the CD8 cytotoxic compartment, there is only a tiny fraction that expresses CD25. And when you look at the levels, there are very low levels of CD25. So humans mirroring the mouse or vice versa. Now we could say that, yeah, those are treatment naive patients, but in the context of today's immunotherapy, most patients will be treated with an anti-PD-1 and most likely CD25 will be upregulated in response to anti-CD21, uh, uh, anti-PD1. Well, that, that can be tested again. So those are the best hypotheses, the ones that you can test. So this is a clinical trial in patients with renal cell carcinoma for which we were able to access a biopsy of their kidney cancer 
prior to initiation of anti-PD-1 and during anti-PD-1 therapy. And these patients are responding. And what you see here, it's triple color immunofluorescence or immunohistochemistry. The red are the CD8 cells, the blue are the FOX3 cells, and the brown is CD25. And you see how it's preferentially uh, restricted to the Tregs in the baseline biopsy. And when I look at post EP, uh, post nevo biopsies, again, the red are the CD8s and the brown and blue are the Tregs. Uh, blind quantification done by a histopathologist, Teresa Marafiotti, shows in this clinical trial and in another one in melanoma, very similar to this one, that uh, both at baseline and on therapy, CD25 remains restricted primarily to the FOX2 3 positive cells and not to the CD8s. So even in the context of immunotherapy in humans, CD25 seems to be a pretty good target. So then why was it dropped from the, from the pipeline, right? It was dropped by this type of experiments. We did this experiment, Jet's lab did this experiment, and like a lot of people did these experiments. And we all worked at the time, many years ago, 2006 before that, with a clone, an anti-CD25 clone um, named PC61, which many of you might be familiar because it's very widely used. So key thing here is that PC61, it's a rat antibody of the isotype IgG1, right? So rat IgG1, I'll get to, to that in a minute. But the classical experiment that we all did was the following. You take a mouse and you take your favorite therapy, my favorite therapy at that time, again, this is data for my time in Jim's lab, is GVAX and anti-CTLA-4, right? And GVAX and anti-CTLA-4 works very well if you, if you give it shortly after tumor implantation, day three, six, and nine. But here we're taking that therapy and delaying it to day eight, 11, and 14, and you see there is no tumor protection, right? So you take your favorite therapy and you make it suboptimal. And then you combine it with the anti-CD25 on a prophylactic setting. Again, this is what everybody did originally. So you deplete T-Rex four days before you implanted the tumor. You take an aliquot of blood before you implant the tumor to make sure the T-Rex are gone, they're gone. And then you go with your suboptimal vaccine and lo and behold, you get the blue line, very nice synergy. And you say depleting T-Rex is a great tool to treat cancer. But that's not the experiment that you will do in the clinic, right? In the clinic, if mice were to translate, you will go therapeutic. You will want to have the tumor implanted a tiny microenvironment, as tiny as you want, but have it there, and then go with your therapeutic intervention. And when we and everybody else did this experiment, we got no synergy, right? So it works prophylactically, it doesn't work therapeutically. And the prevailing wisdom from many was, well, you're killing your CD25 activated effector cells in the tumor. But I hope I show you enough data already supporting the fact that we don't find those CD25 high effector cells in the tumor even in the context of immunotherapy. So what's going on? So this is Fred Arce in my lab. He took this question and he said, look, you know what? I haven't seen any data that demonstrates or any experiments attempting to demonstrate that the antibody is killing activated effector cells in the tumor. So let me go and have a look at the tumor, see what's going on here with a clean slate, right? White canvas. Take mice, he leaves them untreated or he treats them with the anti-CD25 and then he looks inside the tumor microenvironment. This is therapeutic killing of the T-Rex. The untreated animals, there is a large fraction, large fraction that is a double positive, that is FOX2 three positive. La vast majority of them are double positive for CD25 and FOX. No surprises there. Interestingly, when he treats with the anti CD25 RAD ITG1, clone PC61, yeah, the CD25 positive cells are gone, but the FOX2 three cells are not gone, right? And we're not using, here we're using a different clone to stain. So this is not competition on the staining. What's going on here is that the antibody, for some reason, it's not depleting the T-Rex and it's only inducing the downregulation of CD25, so inducing capping of the receptor, giving you the false illusion that you are depleting. So really what this data suggested the first time he showed in a lab meeting is that, oh wait, the antibody is not failing because it's killing effector cells. The antibody might be failing because it's not killing anything. So what is that? So then obviously we were learning a lot about FC receptors because of the work with anti-CTLA-4 antibodies. So we went and characterized this beautiful antibody that we all have used, PC61. And we learned that as an uh, that rat IgG ones, when you put it in a mouse, they don't bind to one of the most important mouse FC receptors, which is FC receptor gamma four. Right. So the machinery that is needed for an antibody to kill in tissues is not functioning. Right. That, at least that was the hypothesis, and that's because we use again a rat antibody. So what Fred did, he took the P61 variable region and he cloned it into a classical mouse IgG two A to make it a proper depleting antibody, and he recovered the affinity to FC gamma receptor four, as you see here. So then he ran the experiment and long story short, he goes from 
no depletion, to down regulation of CD25 with the old antibody, to a fourfold reduction on the frequency of regulatory T cells. So now he fixed the antibody in terms of its ability to deplete T-Rex just by getting the FC receptors to talk to the FC portion of the antibody. So the antibody speaks in terms of T-Rex depletion. Does that affect anti-tumor activity? So again, we want to go therapeutically. So in this, he uses a model, MCA205. He waits until the tumors are palpable and he gives one single shot of the different anti-CD25 antibodies. And this mouse model, it's uh, resistant to um, anti-PD1. So we decided to use it, obviously, to see whether we could find some synergy. This is the data from those experiments. Untreated animals, they all grow tumors. Animals treated uh, with the anti-CD25 rat one. So this antibody, again, it depletes in lymph node and spleen, but it fails to deplete in the tumor and there is no tumor protection. If we give the anti-PD1 antibody, these mice are resistant to it. And if you, you combine this antibody that gives you nothing with this antibody that gives you nothing, you get nothing, so no synergy. A single shot of the new anti-CD25, the one that now it's engineered to interact properly with the mouse activating FC receptors. For the first time, it gives us two complete responses out of 13 mice. And actually the responses are quite interesting because the tumors get really big and some of them collapse, others collapse, but then relapse. So there is something going on in these tumors. And that something going on synergizes extremely well with the anti-PD-1 now given us 11 out of 14 complete responses, right? And there's no, no doubt here that the tumors are established or they get to very established tumors and then they collapse. So at this moment, we're super, super excited about CD25 because we thought we figured this whole thing out, et cetera, et cetera. And we started a collaboration with a tiny company and we convinced them, look, we need to use this, resuscitate this target. We need to, to, to target T-Rex using this antibody. So we started collaborating with this company and the first question they ask us is this, is this the best you can do, right? So I've been working on this thing for years. And the first thing they say, well, this might not be good enough and all that. Quite annoying, but actually a very interesting question. And it made us go back a little bit more onto what we were doing and, and wonder where did we sit with this concept comparing to everything else that had been done on CD25. And what's quite interesting, it was quite telling is that there were already two antibodies against CD25 that have been testing in the clinical setting, right? Uh, they're called daclizumab and basiliximab. They were testing against solid tumors to deplete T-Rex and they never, they never produced striking responses, but they were not developed for that. They were actually developed as antibodies to treat uh, graft versus host disease and, and, uh, and autoimmunity. And the reason that they were developed for that is because these antibodies were developed to bind to CD25 and prevent IL-2 binding and signaling. So they were actually IL-2 blockers. They could deplete a CD25 expressing cell, but they are really IL-2 blockers. And so happened that we were lucky enough that the PC61 antibody, it's also a partial IL-2 blocker, right? And one of the things that happens when you deplete T-Rex is that you have more IL-2 free. So we wonder about the following. And again, it was a model or a concept. What we have inside the tumor microenvironment is regulatory cells with a lot of CD25 and effector cells with very little, very similar to the CTLA-4 story. When you deplete the T-Rex, you have um, more IL-2 available. But if PC61 or the Clisimab and Basiliximab are binding to CD25, not depleting the effector cell because there's not enough on the surface to induce depletion, but blocking that IL-2, then we're wasting a pretty good T cell growth factor, right? And that might be bad, that, that, that might not be optimal. So we wonder whether we could make a different antibody to a separate epitope that will allow still the depletion of the T-Rex, but allow that IL-2 to bind and signal into the effector cells, giving us that loop of activation. So again, that, that was an hypothesis, but it was testable. So we talked to this little company, we convinced them really quickly, and they said, we'll make the antibody. So we made antibodies like this and we screened them. And this is just some data validating the fact that the, the new antibody that we made, which we call anti-CD25 NIB, non-IL-2 blocking, was doing what it was supposed to. This is a piece that five, what we do here, we take T cells, we drizzle them with um, IL-2, and then we measure signaling through piece that five. So if you do that, you get like about 50% of the T cells, let's look at the graph. 50% of the T cells um, are piece that five positive. If you uh, treat them with the anti-CD25 NIP, the new antibody that we made, you don't lose signaling. PC61 kills about 50% of that signaling. And as a control, a neutralizing anti-IL-2 antibody completely kills signaling, right? So we made an antibody that we think it's better than P61, should be much better than the Clisimab in terms of not blocking IL-2. And then we tested it, right? So you tested it by doing the mouse experiment. 
So mice left untreated, um, they will grow tumors. If you treat your mice, again, with now one single shot of the PC61 that Fred made, the one that, that, that blocks IL-2, but that depletes T-Rex, so it's engineered to deplete T-Rex, you get that 10% complete responses, another 10% of delays in tumor growth, but most of the mice need to be sacrificed. So this is the antibody that requires anti-PD-1 to work. And we think that that's because it's blocking IL-2. And this is the data with the anti-CD25 NIF. One single shot, monotherapy, 100% complete responses in the vast majority of the models that we try that are highly T-cell infiltrated. So if the models are T-cell infiltrated, um, they will respond to this antibody quite well. Is IL-2 really doing the trick, right? So that, that was the hypothesis. So this can be tested again. So these are mice um, left untreated, mice treated with the anti-CD25 nib, right? And there's nice tumor control. And if you, on top of the CD25 nib, you add an anti-IL-2 neutralizing antibody in the blue line, you lose tumor control. Now, that is not surprising, IL-2 is important. What we really wanted to demonstrate is that the blocking activity of PC61 is not allowing it to work as well as, as, as it should work. And that experiment is this one. So we combine the anti-CD25 nib with PC61. So this antibody will deplete, but this antibody will block IL-2, and there you go in yellow line, you completely lose anti-tumor uh, responses. Supporting the notion that the problem with the current, with PC61, in terms of working as a monotherapy, and most likely with the clizumab and basiliximab in the clinic, is that those antibodies are blocking IL-2 signaling into the effector. So they might be depleting the T-Rex, but then you are uh, thwarting the activity of the effectors by taking out that precious uh, growth factor. And we did a lot of experiments to try their activity in different models. So this is a model of acquired resistance to CPIs. Um, in this model, uh, we challenge the mice with a lot of tumor and we leave them untreated and you have this very heterogeneous tumor growth. So some grow faster, some grow slower. But when you give them um, anti-PDL1 at three time points, at day six, nine, and 12, you see that all the tumors sort of synchronize and they stop growing between day 15 and 20, or they slow down, if you want to put it that way. But then they all relapse. They all synchronize and relapse. All the mice will die. So we wonder whether trying to mirror what could happen in the clinic, um, whether we could go with a single dose of the anti-CD25 as you are given the anti pdl one and prevent this acquisition of resistance. And the answer is yes, that in 50% of the cases, we got complete responses. So we have a basically a 50% reduction, reduction in acquired resistance by single dose of the new anti-CD25 non-IL2 blocking antibody. As I said, this antibody works as a monotherapy in uh, immunogenic tumors, but, but I think that we need to move into uh, more immune cold or poorly inflamed tumors. And um, the classical way that you can try to get these tumors a bit more infiltrated is through vaccines. So may I go back to the old school of GVAX, right? And uh, GVAX on its own and with anti ctl 4 is the same. It doesn't work. In this scenario, not even the combination with anti ctl 4 and GVAX because we're intervening very late works. But what GVAX does give you, it's a little bit of the effector infiltration. So we tried it. We did the anti-CD25 NIP as a monotherapy in this B16 melanoma. And there is no real increase in survival, but it's, there is an interesting split of the curves and there is a delay in tumor growth. And most importantly, when you combine the two, so GVAX and a single dose of the anti-CD25, you see that the vast majority of the tumors, with exception of two, they actually contract. So they show a primary response that is very powerful and then relapse, which we're, we're trying to understand now. So we're characterizing that relapse. But the point is that there is a, a significant increase in survival when you now combine anti-CD25 with, with a vaccine in a model that is poorly immunogenic. Now that's just tumor protection. What I really like about these experiments is that you can do a lot of very cool functional studies. And primarily the tools that we use is either um, high dimensional flow cytometry or single cell RNA-seq. So I'm gonna show you some high dimensional flow cytometry of these tumor microenvironments. So uh, this is just a heat map showing all the different uh, populations. This is unsupervised clustering analysis. So it's just telling you what populations you have in general and what, what do those populations um, express. Forget about that for a second, because I think that this type of analysis on the right sheds a bit more light. So this is a differential expression volcano type analysis where we're looking here. Anything to the right are populations marked here that are increased with the anti-CD25 therapy over untreated, or that are increased with GVAX over untreated, or that are increased in the combo treatment over untreated. Right? So this is how we start dissecting mechanisms without having to click in every single graph. And basically what the data um, tells you is that 
population 15 are the chirides. So when, when you give the anti-CD25, the first thing that disappears are the regulatory cells. But the other thing that is interesting is that there is this population of activated CD4s. These are CD4s that are 25 high and PD1 very, very high. And I think Roberta will remember this. This population have been um, named as potential regulatory Fox feature negative regulators um, by JET's team. So those cells go as well. So I don't know if they are regulated or not, but they're being eliminated by the antibody the same way that the T-Rex are. And the other interesting thing is that there is an increase, a significant increase, everything above this dotted line is significant, significant increase in the population of resting CD8s. This means CD8s that don't express very high levels of PD-1. When you look at the GVAX, what the GVAX does primarily, it increases a population of activated CDA cells. So this is, con this is consistent with priming and infiltration of activated effector cells with GVAX alone. And then when you look at the combination in GVAX and anti-CD25, you see the reduction of that potentially suppressive helper population of CD4 population, an increase um, on activated uh, and resting um, effector uh, CD8s and CD4s here. And quite interesting in terms of synergy, for the first time we're starting to see significant changes in the level of natural killer cells. So not only activation of the innate compartment, but this combo is leading, um, sorry, not adapted, but this combo is leading to activation of the innate compartment. So lots of things going on when you have this combination. And again, we're trying to dissect it further. Now, all of this data, right? If you were to summarize it one line, it's like we have a new antibody that could actually, I think could make a difference in the clinic. And we were just in time as we were building up this collaboration, to, with this data, inform the development of a clinical antibody against CD25. So what we decided to do is to, um, again, in collaboration with this uh, tiny biotech in the UK, to in the screening that we're doing for anti-human CD25 antibodies, for antibodies that will bind to Tregs very well, that will not block IL2 signaling, right? So we added the PSTAR5 to that assay, and then that they were able to induce high levels of ADCC. And just to make sure we had enough ADCC, we also generated that antibody on an aficosylated uh, format. And, and now this little company was purchased by Roche. So all the data I'm gonna show you is now in collaboration with Roche. This is the crystal structure uh, done by the Roche team on the CD25 antibody that now the human counterpart is called RG62. And as you see here, this is IL-2 receptor alpha, the beta and the gamma subunit. In purple, you have IL-2. And this side here is the antibody. So as you see, it binds to a different phase of IL-2 receptor alpha than the one needed for binding to IL-2. And that's why it doesn't block IL-2 signaling, right? It does not intervene. These are PSTAR-5 assays done uh, on regulatory T cells and activated effector cells, but now from humans and using the antibody. And what you see here is that daclizumab as a control, complete ablation of, or near complete ablation of PSTAR-5 on the T-Rex, on the helper CD4s and on the cytotoxic CD8, as predicted, Meanwhile, the Roche antibody that we developed uh, basically doesn't affect IL-2 signaling. So we have an antibody that doesn't block IL-2 signaling. We test depletion in vitro. So we take PBMCs from a patient or from a healthy donor. We give them anti-CD3 in vitro, plus minus different increasing amounts of the anti-CD25 and IB. And you see those dependent killing of the T-Rex with uh, very little impact on the activated effector cells only at very high amounts of the antibody. Most importantly, you need to test this in a tumor microenvironment. So short of a clinical trial, we make single cell suspensions from samples from patients with lung cancer or colorectal cancer, and we leave them untreated or we treat them with the antibody. And what you see there is a decrease or significant decrease in the amount of regulatory T cells within that microenvironment. So the antibody can kill with no problem regulatory T cells in the context of a human, well, of a single cell suspension of a human tumor microenvironment. And it's not affecting the effector cells. And I think this is my last slide. Um, what we did then, it was to create some humanized mice with um, CD human CD34 progenitors um, uh, that we constituted a human immune system in an NSG mouse that is then challenged with a human prostate tumor. So it's really suboptimal models, but allows us to test the antibody in vivo in some sort of close to the clinic or not so far away from the clinic microenvironment. And what you see here is the uh, mice left untreated. If we look in the tumor, at the CD4s or the CD8s, you see CD25 versus FOX, very nice double positive population. When you give the anti-CD25 NIB, RT62, you see beautiful depletion of the CD25 high FOX P3 and sparing of the CD25 negatives. And what's very nice and consistent with the depletion of T-Rex, 
we now have very uh, high levels of CD8 cells that have upregulated PD1 and CTLA4, right? So highly activated. Yes, they will be regulated by those checkpoints, but they're highly activated effector cells. We decided to benchmark this experiment because we have the opportunity with EP. And you see that here, EP, which is the anti-human CTLA4, it depletes the T-Rex regardless of them being CD25 because it's targeting CTLA4. So very nice depletion of the regulatory cells. But what's quite interesting and, and consistent with what I showed you at the beginning, our hypothesis, I don't see anymore that population of very high PD-1 positive cells. And we think that that could be because the antibody is having some depleting activity over the very activated effector cells. And that's just the quantification. So all of this and all this hard work by our team, by the Roche team, led to a clinical trial that is not open and recruiting in a phase one uh, um, monotherapy against tumors with highly um, infiltrated, um, with high infiltrates, so melanoma, lung cancer, um, and the others. And uh, so far, I think that they're at the doses scale, and we hope that soon we will be hearing from them, but very, very excited to see something absolutely basic coming up from trying to understand why something was not working to uh, really develop what could become a, a very interesting um, therapeutic in our arsenal. So the conclusions from our work is the CD25 is a selective target for therapeutic T-reg depletion in mice and men, even in the context of anti pd one therapy. The failures of the anti-mouse CD25 depleters, we believe, were due to poor understanding of how antibodies really work in a, in a mouse and human microenvironment, particularly the role of FC receptors. You could fix those antibodies by just swapping the FC portion to a proper depleter, which is the mouse IgG2A. But most importantly, those antibodies still had one more fault, which is the fact that they can block IL-2 signaling. So if you want to get the best response of the world, take down the T-Rex and allow that beautiful IL-2 to signal and activate uh, your effector T cells. And that's what we think that this next generation anti-human CD25 NIP that Roche is putting in the clinic um, is doing. So with that, I'll thank uh, my, uh, my team. Uh, they're all in red, so I, I won't mention them. Cancer Research UK, Dust Therapeutics, which was the little biotech that believed in, in our concept initially, and Roche who has taken this all the way to the clinic and, and, and I hope will deliver phenomenal results soon. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. That was great. Um, I'm sold. I hope the clinical trial works out. Um, perhaps too. we can take a quick question before we log off. And so I'm looking at the chat. And um, so Eugenio is asking, we believe that a true T-Reg are FOXP3 positive and C25 positive, and that there are studies that have shown that C25 knockout T-Regs are in fact non-functional. So even if you're not depleting the T-Regs, they might still not be functional. Is that true? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so with this antibody, if we're not, the, well, so we are depleting T-Rex, but let's imagine we were not depleting the T-Rex. Um, this antibody will not ablate their function in theory because it's not blocking IL-2, right? And in fact, this is, again, if we can talk about hypothesis, I think that that's a potentially a big distinguisher between CTLA-4 and CD25 because the CTLA-4, even if it doesn't deplete T-Rex, it will still block their function by blocking CTLA-4. Um, meanwhile, the CD25 wouldn't. The CTLA-4 antibody does not deplete T-Rex in the gut, at least that's what people are saying, but it gives you lots of toxicity in the gut. And I wonder whether that's because of the blocking activity. So I would predict that if that is the case, the CD25 will not give so much gut toxicity compared to the CTLA-4. But again, it's all hypothesis, but testable eventually. Okay, another quick question uh, from Dr. Zapazodi. Um, so would it make sense to combine C25 NIB with PD-1 blockade or ACT CAR T cells? So with PD-1, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and we've done it. With PD-1 also makes a lot of sense. With um, any sort of adopted cell therapy, it depends on the levels of CD25 you get on those cells post-generation, post-manufacturing, right? So to create those cells, usually need a high dose IL-2, um, and that drives initial upregulation of that receptor, so they will make it a very good target for the antibody, so you might end up killing them. But most cases, but I don't know in CAR T cells, I know until, the receptor is downregulated because overexposure to IL-2, so it might combine. I think the only way to know is, is to, to do the experiments. Excellent. So I think with that, we're ready to close for today. I'd like to thank before logging off uh, Dr. Zabazodi, Professor Quesada, and Dr. Uh, Geldof, Delgoff for their wonderful talks today. And I hope you all enjoyed it and go about your day a bit more T-Reg inspired. Um,
Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And a uh, fantastic discussion. Yes, truly appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.